Okay, so next speaker is uh, David Dubenaut. Uh, he did his uh, PhD in Cambridge. I, I had the luck to, to share office for a while with him. And then he moved to Harvard to do a postdoc with Ryan Adams. And from there uh, to University of Toronto as an assistant professor where he is now. Thank you, David. Okay, can you hear me out? Great. Okay, so this is fun because Sebastian invited me to come give a talk on GANs, and I've never really worked on GANs much, but in the past sort of eight months, I've been playing around with these, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about this one idea. And here, I don't know if you guys recognize it. It's like Ouroboros. It's like, look, this particular clip I found is a little bit emo, but... Um, okay, All right, so first I want to say, well, yeah, let's say GAN... Yeah. So training GANs is obviously very tricky. I don't know if any of you guys have actually tried to implement one from scratch. You can, of course, download code where someone has already pre-trained all the like leaky railer to have the exact right leakiness rate and stuff like that, and then it can work. Otherwise, you might spend a few weeks playing with it. So the first thing I do when there's a new technique is I make my own code from scratch, and I found it very hard to code a GAN from scratch without just copying parameter values from someone else. Um, and you know, I'm working with this one student, John Lorraine, who. He sort of says, well, this is kind of weird, this optimization where we train the discriminator to play against the, uh, this generator, we update it, and then we train the new generator to learn against the old discriminator. And, you know, this, this, this well, leads to these well-known circular dynamics. And so this is what I saw the first time I tried to code up again. And so f one thing I want to show you guys is, uh, let's see. Oh, man, that's brutal. Wait, oh, it's here. It's all here. Beautiful. Okay, that's cool. Um, yeah, so first of all, I want to say, so now people are getting to know PyTorch a little bit and sort of still, for some reason, adapting this horrible OO style. But here is, here is like a GAN if you can actually use a language like Python. So, so here's a neural network. It's a, you know, a for loop. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's brutal. Okay, man. Okay, let's just... That's brutal. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can make it both large and, let's see. Hmm. Uh, that's such a, I'm so sad. Okay, there's yeah. no, oh, you, okay, well, you can see it now. Okay, great. So, where were we? Here we go. Yeah, so this is a, a neural network, right? It's just a for loop, and if we have tuples, we can have a list of tuples for the weights in our neural network, right? Like, we don't need some massive OO thing that someone wrote for us. We can just take a dot product and then ReLU, and ReLU is just max zero one. Anyway, um, so here is my generator network. It takes in random seed, generates some random noise, and then puts that through a neural network. And this is the magic of likelihood-free models, right? And this is sort of why we love GANs. And then the discriminator, well, it just has another neural network that is outputs some sort of unnormalized log probability, depending on which divergence you're optimizing, we will change the interpretation of that. And now the objective, which is even a little more complicated than it needs to be, because I'm going to set up for something later. You know, we just generate some fake data, we evaluate some sort of, maybe not a log probability, it depends on the, the divergence, where we just feed the discriminator the fake data, we also feed the discriminator the real data, and then we have the sort of average of the difference of these things. And maybe we play around with extra stuff according to Sebastian's uh, rules. Um, so let's run this. And let's just try to fit a 1D Gaussian here. And OK, yes, it's working. OK, so, this, so the red is the discriminator. So it goes between 0 and 1. And it's the probability of seeing real data. The green is the real uh, distribution that we're trying to approximate. And the blue is samples from our uh, generator. And you know, I'm training with a bit of momentum, so it's kind of easier to see what the dynamics are doing. But you can see that basically, you know, I, the, the same thing would happen if we didn't have momentum. It would just be harder to sort of observe the dynamics. But we see this sort of cyclical behavior where, you know, the screener says, oh, you need to be more to the left, and then it swings to the left, swings to the right. Um, and, you know, maybe if we averaged over many uh, iterations, we would get something sensible, but this is just awful. And it's hard, you know, you should always, always start in one dimension, right? It's hard to tell what's going on if you're doing this uh, for NIPs or something. Or it's not NIPs, for yeah. MNIST. Yep. Can I just mention this? <laughs> because this is a sample. Yes. And this has been studied for like decades in optimization. Mm -hmm. And what you're implementing here is called the projected grid method, which well, you see it like that. I mean, if you average, it converge. Or if you do a look ahead, it also converges. Yeah. I know, I know. I mean, I realize that people have made progress on training GANs, and they. It's you know, not training GANs. It's just 
looking at it from a set point perspective, which is what it is. Okay, yes, I agree. Just saying, oh, we don't know about this, and we just make a bunch of hacks again. Okay, although to be fair, the original GAN papers did claim you could get train these if you just use some sort of like gradient descent or, or whatever the standard thing is. So. Anyway, I agree that optimizing minimax problems and these sort of things is like a well-studied classical problem. Yeah. yeah, I'm just saying, here's what happens if you try the naive thing without being enlightened about optimization. Yes, okay. I like torch code with the uh, Really, I don't, really. <laughs> no, exactly, like PyTorch is, is exactly doing these same ideas. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so here is this idea that I mean, the student were saying was that, okay, let's let the discriminator know which generator it's playing against. So now we'll change the signature of our discriminator function to not just take in the current image and its own parameters, but also to get to see all the parameters of whatever generative process was producing the particular examples that it's trying to discriminate with respect to. Okay, and that, that's sort of what we're going to talk a little bit about. And now the idea is that this might help deal with these sort of optimization issues because now there's only one fixed discriminator function that we have to learn, and it's not relative to, or it's not sort of implicitly relative to the generator it's playing against. Um, and the idea is that if I, you know, learn to play against one generator, uh, then I go in a circle and come back to the generator that I played against before, I already know how to play against them. So actually, the learning dynamics won't take me back to where I was before. Okie dokie. And... So all we have to do here is now we have a discriminator, we can let him take in the generator. So that's the, the simple version's gone. Here we just sort of pass in to the neural network both the, the data concatenated with the, the parameters. And then down here, we'll see where, like we get actually an extra problem because, let's see, where was I? Um, oh no, oh here we are. So now I'm trying to specify the size of my discriminator, and so it was a deep net with 30 hidden layers, then 20. Now it has to be a neural network with you know, data dimension plus the size of the, the number of parameters in the original network uh, feeding into a 30 layer network. However, so this is now a much more complicated discriminator model. However, now when we train it, of course, yeah, it's slower because we have this huge discriminator that has to look at the generator, but without fiddling around with the optimizer at all, just doing something very naive, we get something that, well, it you know, looks pretty good and it's stable. Um, you know, maybe we need to fiddle around with it a little bit more, but the point is we don't observe these funny dynamics without even needing to crack open our, you know, minimax optimization textbook. Okay. So, going back. Okay, and you know, we can look at now what happens. So we've basically taken the standard GAN objective and added this extra set of parameters that gets fed into the discriminator. So one thing that my students did is say, okay, well, what now does the gradient look like when I'm updating the generator? And now this is funny because the gradient update of the generator depends on what the discriminator is going to do, which depends on what the generator is going to do. So, you know, maybe it's a little bit too much to unpack, but the point is everything in red here are is new terms that the uh, gradient of the generator gets, which depend on, uh, that's kind of small, sorry, the, how the discriminator is going to change in response to my own change, right? So this is kind of like we're getting unrolled GANs for free, in a sense, because now when the generator moves, he gets to say, well, I'm going to take into account how the discriminator was going to change in response to my original proposed move, right? So this sort of just falls out automatically, and that's kind of nice. Okay. Um, so, and I, and I was kind of sad because I was thinking about this and then um, the paper by, you know, Dustin Tran and these guys was talking about Bayesian GANs, where again, to do anything sensible, we would have to sort of know which generator we've sampled from our sort of current posterior. So yeah, this same idea has now hit the literature already. Um, and, you know, this is again, like, work in progress. So anyone who has suggestions, I'm all ears. So there's sort of two major problems with this approach. One is, you know, I talked about avoiding circular dynamics, but if, we're tr if we play against a generator and then train the discriminator some more against other generators, then there might be some sort of catastrophic forgetting. It's not really clear that we are going to remember the old generators we played against. So we might have to do some sort of like replay. It's, it's not really clear exactly what should be going on here. Um, 
And another problem, and this is sort of maybe the first problem that means that it's even hard to get this to work on like MNIST, is how do you build a neural network that takes in the race of an entire other neural network, right? So in my example there, the generator had only like 400 parameters. So then the discriminator had to have an extra 400 times 30 parameters. Um, and this is not going to scale to like, you know, giant DC, uh, deconvolutional GANs and stuff. So actually, one thing I was hoping you guys would come up, help me come up with is just a name for this sort of class of uh, networks, right? So people have been a bit excited about hyper networks where it's one neural network outputs the weights of a, another neural network. Here we have the sort of converse problem. Um, yeah, and if anyone has a good name for this, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I, ca I can't think of one. Um, right, and so if we just naively do this, we end up with this huge neural network, and it sort of depends on the particular parameterization we choose as well. Um, so, you know, I've been chatting with Roger Gross about this, and we were saying, well, maybe we could look at sort of like aggregate statistics or the activations or something like that. Um, but ideally, we want to somehow learn about what the generator is doing or characterize it in some parameter invari sorry, yeah, parameterization invariant way. Um, so one thing I want to say is that we also see the exact same problem of conditioning on a neural network when we try to solve Bayesian VAEs. Um, okay, so normally in a version autoencoder, we integrate out the Z for every X. And sort of we can't not be Bayesian in this setting because the more data we have, the more random variables we have. So we can't rely on some law of large numbers or whatever to, you know, help us um, identify these Zs. We have to integrate them out. But if we are training on lots of data, we can rely on sort of large numbers to help us identify these, um, you know, these generator parameters. However, maybe we want to have like, you know, some fancy multitask, semi-supervised learning, who knows what. And we, if we want to be Bayesian about this in the sort of a larger sense, we could also integrate out these uh, generator parameters, okay? So what this requires now is in not just getting a approximate posterior over Q of Zi given Xi, but now we have to have an approximate posterior over Q of Zi given the generative model we're looking at and Xi, okay? So we really can't, I, I claim, although I haven't really demonstrated this, that we can't just continue using a fixed Q Zi given Xi for like any possible theta because the sort of theta determines what the meaning of Z is. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't really make sense. I mean, this maybe could be made to work, I'm not sure. Um, so what the obvious thing we can do is say, okay, we'll have a Q of theta and then we'll have another Q of Zi given theta Xi. This is like a nice way to factorize this, this joint posterior. Um, and now the problem is, again, we have to take in theta to a, a neural network. And yeah, this just is not going to scale when this generator is like some giant deconvolutional neural network. Okay, any, any questions at this point? Okay, so one thing I want to say, one like a li little aside that I don't, I think a lot of people appreciate, maybe especially those guys at DeepMind, but uh, I don't think it's sort of obvious, but you know, Bayesian neural networks are not really scary. They're not hard to get to work. Um, Oh shoot, where is that? Sorry, one sec. Here we go. So, you know, if I just apply the sort of um, stochastic variational inference to a likely defined by a neural network, it's really easy to train a approximate posterior in the same way that we train all of our models. And, you know, we get all the goodness of you know, any Bayesian model where we are certain about the data where the data is, or certain about the function where the data is, and uncertain where it isn't, and, you know, get all sorts of interesting structure, and we can do this for, like, values. It's all for free. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen all this Bayes by Backprop stuff by DeepMind. It's really strange because all they did was reinvent automatic differenti differentiation variational inference, which just says, write down your neural network in the same code that I had before, and then optimize this scale by, the, by these five lines. Anyway. Um, if we had time, I would have a live demo where you guys can like shout out the architecture and show you that this will work for out of the box for like any uh, sort of layer network architecture or layer activations. But this is kind of a point I, I don't think people appreciate yet. You can just train Bayesian neural networks now. Um, let's see. Okay, going back. Here we go. So, anyways, that was just an aside to say that this part is sort of okay. This having a queue of theta. What you saw there was samples from a Q of theta that was working pretty well. So anyway, but we just don't know how to do this part yet. 
Okay, so I was saying it would be nice if we could somehow characterize some other neural network in a way that didn't depend directly on its parameters. So the obvious way is through its gradients. And this idea has sort of exactly already been done by Max Welling and Dirk Kingma, which is to say, well, what if we somehow use the gradients of our generator network to adjust Z in some sort of iterative manner? Um, and yeah, th these are like statistics of some fancy neural network that don't sort of grow in, I guess, uh, well, yeah, they, they're sort of parameterization invariant, let me just say that. Um, so this is known as Hamiltonian variational inference by, by Dirk Kingman and Max Welling. And also a similar idea was recently used in this DeepMind paper on Bayesian RNNs where they said, let's actually take a single gradient step according to the gradient of uh, sort of P of Z with respect to Z to data current Q. Um, and so here, here's just like some hot off the press. Actually this morning my student Chris sent me these figures of, you know, showing that we can have these sort of nice adaptive distributions. So, and of course, actually I should mention the importance way that our encoder is doing the same idea. So what we see here is just four different posteriors that we'd like to approximate. Here is like a Gaussian uh, sort of Q distribution that we don't think would do a good job of fitting any of one of these. Um, here is the approximate posterior we would, we would be zapping from if we did five importance uh, re-weighting sort of steps. Like the idea is if we sampled five uh, points from this one and then sampled from those in proportion to the true posterior, this costs five times as much as a single sample, but we get this like really great posterior. And you know, here's us playing around with these Hamiltonian things where we sample from this proposal and then bounce around the posterior according to the gradient for a little while, according to Hamiltonian dynamics. And we just sort of started working on this. It doesn't quite work as well. Um, but anyway, the point is that even important sampling is an example of using the current generator network to adapt our, our posterior. So yeah, so people are working on similar ideas in uh, you know, variational autoencoders that we might be able to sort of convert back to GANs. Um, yeah, so, so maybe I would call these things like discriminator aware generators um, if we were to phrase them in the language of GANs. It's, it's kind of funny. But so, yeah, so here's, here's a proposal for a set of uh, generators that use the same idea. So, not, yeah, again, we're, we're not talking about. Uh, discriminator where it generates anymore, now we're doing the converse, which is discriminator, or sorry, we're not talking about generator aware discriminators like we were in the first part of the talk, now we're doing the converse idea. Okay, so here's an idea that I'm kind of surprised hasn't been done, and maybe it has in the last like month, I haven't been following archive. Uh, what if we try producing multiple samples from our generative network and then just like choose which one, you know, to actually output according to how much the discriminator likes them. Okay, so, so here's sort of like, I'll just define, here's like the standard generator function, which is just take a z from our prior and then return x as g of z. And here's sort of like a, a the simplest possible thing is like a multi-try where we get, say, t tries, and we just independently sample z's and ask how much does the discriminator think that they're real. And then if I wanted to, I could just output the best one. Or I could output them in like proportion to the, the probability that the discriminator thinks they're real or something, right? So here we can take the idea from importance weighted autoencoders and just say this is the corresponding generator. Um, so again, we pay this extra cost of t because we have to just use the discriminator. But now the generator isn't so sensitive to what the, the current discriminator is, right? And you can even imagine the same generator uh, working pretty well on, on multiple different discriminators uh, if given enough samples. Okay, so, and of course now we don't just have to blindly try independent samples, we can do this sort of adaptive thing. And the nice thing about GANs is we don't have to worry about like Jacobians or um, trying to get a normalized distribution at the end. We can just output samples and let the discriminator clean up after us. So here is like a really simple sort of gradient adaptive generator where we choose one sample and then move it in the direction of sort of what would make the discriminator like this sample even more. Okay, um, and you know this again is kind of similar to all the stuff that you know David Fow and lots of people have been talking about, where we can sort of learn to optimize, and we can say that well, there's a few parameters here, like maybe what is the step sizes we're taking, or you know all sorts of different uh, ways we can tune this optimizer. And so in an outer loop, the parameters of the generator would also include like how what sort of like you know gradient and momentum steps would we be taking. Okay, and now one thing that I 
like to use to try to understand ideas is take them to the logical extreme. Yeah? So the unrolled, yeah, good question. So the question is, how is this different from the unrolled Yan? Uh, so very good question. So uh, the, it is like a very similar idea. But here the idea is that the unrolled Yan would say, I'm going to take the gradient step from my generator if I had updated the parameters of my uh, discriminator sort of 10 times. And now this is slightly different. I'm just saying, I'm just saying I want to choose on this day a uh, sample that the discriminator will like by getting to query him to sort of improve it. And this has like a really nice interpretation like of how maybe I would try to draw a picture is I would like draw maybe a crude face and then I might, I would use my discriminator to say, oh crap, I forgot the nose. And then I add the nose, right? It's, it's, it has a nice, uh, in, yeah, nice intuition. Okay, and the idea is that, um, well, I'll get to this. Okay, so yeah, we're learning to optimize in the generator a little bit. And now let's take this idea to its logical conclusion just to maybe poke holes in it. Because again, this is all half-baked ideas. I want lots of feedback. So what if we even got rid of the generator network? Okay, so we have like a generator-free generator. Um, and so we'll just choose, let's say that there's no Z space anymore, there's just X, so we'll just ran randomly sample some image from like white noise. And now do T steps of gradient descent, making that image be more likely to be classified as real by the discriminator. Uh, five okay. So, I mean, this is maybe going too far. I mean, and it's, you know, I, I think I would like to maybe spend some time thinking about what the optimal discriminator would be like, because we sort of know that it can't just be sort of 50-50 everywhere, like in most sort of GAN formulations, because then there would be no, no more gradient. Uh, yep. So, I mean, in some sense, a lot of people think about GAN as just finding good negatives for an energy compensation, um, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what that was an improvement upon was now, let's see, or something like that, you pick something that moves towards a, I mean, in some sense, you're going back around to the thing that came from, it was an improvement over. Yeah, so that's a really good point. So the, the point is that, well, we're trying to move away from things like MCMC, where you had to do some iterative scheme to try to sample. Um, the nice thing about GAN is that you get this sort of amortized generator that you just run once and it's fast and it's quick. And I totally agree. And like, you know, all of these uh, things, these, uh, these iterative things are horrible because we have to evaluate our expensive discriminator T times and that's, that's going to make these things slower. I totally agree. And there's also something else, which is that the generator has something else in structure. I mean, we're using comments as the generator. They really get, you know, a good fire on what we expect to generate as good negatives in the way. So that's another good point. So I don't know, I guess, just because the mic won't pick it up, I'll just say, yeah. So the idea is that one nice thing about GANs is that we can put the complementary structure that the discriminator has into the generator, like instead of a decomponent, have a confident. I agree, although I would say we know how to do that for confidence and decomponents. I don't think it's always obvious how to do that. But I agree that that's also a good point. That sometimes we have it for free, so let's just use it. Um, right. Okay. So anyway, I mean, well, okay. So all I wanted to say was that this extreme maybe seems nonsensical, so maybe that pokes holes in this idea a little bit in the first place. Um, so sort of one thing I want to think about, though, is just from an optimization point of view, is um, we might expect to see some big win from removing the generator or recognition network. And the reason that this is the case is that these two networks are sort of very tightly coupled. And I mean, I, I think this is kind of an obvious point. But we are doing this uh, optimization where the optimal uh, generator depends on like what the discriminator is doing and vice versa. So you know, and this is exactly when we expect optimization to be hard, right? Is when we're optimizing two entire functions that are really sort of uh, sort of functionals of one another. So uh, I would guess I would say that maybe one intuition about why uh, at least having a little bit, maybe a few iterations of this sort of thing would be worthwhile is that it would sort of relax these tight coupling constraints and that, you know, the same generator might work against a slightly different discriminator and vice versa. Okay, so, so that's all I have to say um, is that we might want to just consider learning one fixed discriminator for all generators. And in this, my little toy example, this did stabilize the optimization, but we have to pay this cost of like, you know, this uh, reparameterization of putting it one network into another neural network. Um, we'll sort of have to do, we'll have to solve this problem anyways when we want to do Bayesian VAEs. Um, and it looks like we can also borrow ideas from building recognition networks for building generators, which is kind of funny because they're sort of opposite jobs. But you know, Iway is kind of like this multi-trigan idea, and then Hamiltonian variational inference is kind of like this adaptive GAN idea. 
Um, and as I just said, I think that trying to optimize both these coupled functions is always going to make optimization really hard. So thanks to these students, John and Chris, who have actually done the work on this. OK, thank you.